You are now listening to Nailed It, the orthopedic surgery podcast. And uh, I know you are so, so kind as to have some cases for us that we can go through. For those that are listening on the, on the audio, um, feel free to check it out on, on YouTube. We will have this video. We'll be referring to some of the different MRIs. We'll try to discuss and, and say everything as best as we can. But if you want to check out a video, go ahead and check it out uh, on YouTube. And yeah, if you, if you want, you could walk us through some of these cases. And um, I mean, we can kind of just go through yeah, them and see what, what these spaces are. So this is um, pretty, uh, pretty timely. This is a 25 year old male. He initially, he had an episode of back pain five months prior, but no leg symptoms. Um, so kind of sounded like, oh, he might've had a discogenic flare of back pain. Um, but then 10 days prior to his presentation to the emergency room, he had onset of leg pain and numbness, right more so than left. And he had an MRI done at an outside hospital and surgery was discussed, but then the surgeon said, you know what, you know, go ahead and uh, go for an epidural uh, steroid injection instead. I don't think you quite need surgery yet. Um, but within a couple of days of the onset of the leg pain and numbness, he said, yeah, I feel like I've had a weak stream. I don't feel oh. like I'm really going to the bathroom well. Um, and it was kind of unclear exactly like when the surgeon and the, and the pain management person were managing him relative to the onset, but he had definitely had at least a week of this urinary dysfunction. And he even at that point had developed constipation that required an enema. And obviously the, the tough thing about bowel movements is oftentimes these patients have a lot of pain, so they may be on opiates. So he was on opiates, um, but certainly constipation requiring an enema in a 25 year old person is, is still fairly uncommon. Um, in this case, it was actually his chiropractor. He, he went to go see a chiropractor to say, Hey, you know, I, nothing's working. He had actually had an epidural injection. If anything, things got worse. And his chiropractor said, Oh my gosh, you need to go to the ER now. Um, yep. so, you know, big old star for that chiropractor. Um, <laughs> you know, I do have some that I really know and trust and, and there are definitely some good eggs out there. And this was one of them. So the patient um, on exam, his proximal strength was severely pain limited. And a lot of times these patients, even just trying to fire their hip flexors, you know, they have trouble because that actually gives them almost like a straight leg raise tension sign. But certainly um, even distally, he had a fair amount of weakness. He had a um, three out of five on the left versus four to five on the right EHL. He did have some weakness in the, in the tibialis anterior on the left. And then the gastroc four out of five on the left versus five out of five on the right. And for a young person to have a four out of five on, on the gastroc, that's pretty significant because usually the gastroc is a, is a pretty strong muscle and, and difficult to get any weakness on uh, motor testing. Um, some sensory deficits, mainly kind of along the lateral aspect of the legs and then the dorsal feet. And um, we didn't bladder scan him when we put in a Foley because at that point we were suspecting he had a lot of retention. He had over a liter. He had 1,200 cc's man. in his bladder. Um, so probably was not very fun to be walking around oh, with a no. liter in his bladder. Um, did have decreased sensation in the perineum and his rectal tone was intact, but he did have decreased perianal sensation. So again, this, um, this is important. You know, some people think that a rectal exam is purely just looking for rectal tone. There's multiple components of it. Um, you want to see whether they have baseline resting tone, but you also want to see, do they have sensation that they feel when you put in your finger, everybody should feel when they, when you put in your finger, if somebody <laughs> Finds it to be not uncomfortable. <laughs> that's concerning. Yes. Um, and can they bear down? So there's multiple aspects of it. So he did have decreased sensation in that region as well. Um, so his, his imaging, this is kind of the classic, you know, where did the nerve roots go? Why is there no spinal canal? There's literally a tiny little sliver of white at the, you know, at the very back of the spinal canal, but literally disc is just completely encompassing the spinal canal here. You kind of wonder how the guy had any strength whatsoever, how the right. nerves were carrying any function at all. And then you see actually, um, he actually did have a smaller um, disc protrusion down at five one as well, but four or five is kind of the major it's the main area culprit. of interest. And when you look back, that actually correlates with where his weakness was most prominent with where his numbness was most prominent was in the L5 distribution. So while he had fairly diffuse findings, it still was most prominent in that traversing nerve root, the L5 nerve root, which is what you would expect with a four or five disc herniation. All right. That's what yeah. I was thinking when you, yeah. uh, when you said his physical exam, I was thinking, oh, this is probably a central 
this carnation at four or five. Exactly. But, uh, yeah, exactly. So you knew what it was before you got the MRI. <laughs> um, so treatment. So urgent evaluation and surgical management. So I mentioned earlier, optimal results are urgent management within 24 to 48 hours. He'd had symptoms for eight days. That's not so good. So certainly, you know, it was, it was overnight. He came in at like 10 PM and certainly there would probably be nothing wrong with doing him the next morning. He'd already gone eight days. You know, there's probably nothing wrong with that, especially if you're at a facility that doesn't have scrub techs that are familiar with spine in the middle of the night. And you think that they would do better the next morning. I think that would certainly be reasonable, um, you know, kind of weighing the risks and benefits. Um, but in his case, I did have staff that could, that could do a spine case. And I said, you know, this poor 25 year old kid has gone eight days. You know, if I can do it sooner, I'll do it sooner. Um, but I did have to counsel him that, Hey, it's been eight days. We know that you really do not have a great prognosis in terms of likelihood of recovering full function. And so we should just go into it, just hoping for what we can hope for getting the pressure off the nerves as soon as possible and just letting them recover to whatever extent they will. Um, but it was, it was a pretty, um, it, it was definitely laying the crepe for, you know, Hey, we don't know what the future will hold, but let's take care of it for now. And then we see what happens. Right. Um, so usually with these, we do have to do a full blown, you know, it's not just one of these laminotomies where we're making a little window in the bone. You saw how that spinal canal was just completely encompassed. Yep. You just can't even safely move aside the nerves without doing a, a, a larger kind of hemilaminectomy, et cetera. So um, basically removing that whole roof of bone at L4, L5. So doing a hemilaminectomy across L4 to really widen that inner laminar window um, so we could fully see um, fully see the uh, nerve roots and the disc herniation. So intraoperatively, his dura was very thin. Basically, when you have severe compression for a longer period of time, it really thins out the dura. You can imagine that dura was like stretched over that like mountain oh, yeah. just below. Um, and so these patients are more um, are more apt to get uh, a dural tear. And he did have one, and so that was repaired primarily. Um, and then uh, you know he was um, he was in the hospital, and we were kind of monitoring how he was doing. So he did go for acute rehab for strengthening and bowel and bladder rehab. Uh, but this gets into, Hey, not, you know, there are lots of unexpected things that crop up. So this is somebody, he had some drainage, um, but unfortunately I was not notified. And so he was placed on Ooh. antibiotics at the rehab. Um, and then, so, you know, it kind of covered up, you know, the fact that he had had drainage. So, um, mm. so it looked okay at his two week follow-up visit. And, but then all of a sudden, as soon as he went off the antibiotics, he had this severe MRSA infection. Um, and really these patients are also going to be more prone to infections because you think about it, they're doing bowel and bladder rehab, you know, so they're, they don't have good urinary function. They don't have good bowel function. They're also typically, you know, if they have more severe deficits there, they might be at a rehab where you're more likely to get an infection. And so, um, you know, he did obviously have risk factors for that. And so he actually, you know, for a little while, it was, you know, not a very good, um, you know, not a lot of fun for him or for me. And so he did eventually require multiple debris months. But Man. the great thing is that despite all of this, despite having this like horrible course, you know, starting off with eight days of catoquinus syndrome that wasn't recognized and having a rough course with, with an infection and all this, he ended up recovering very, very well. He recovered all of his bowel and bladder function and his sexual function. He had full strength on strength testing when I would test him. And he said, yeah, like it fatigues if I work a lot. Um, but like, otherwise he was 100%, you know, full motor strength. He didn't really, I think he had like a little numbness on the top of his foot, but he's able to do completely normal activities. He even, he came in to see me like two years after his surgery and he said, yeah, like I want to work over the summer, helping out my friend, you know, we're going to be like, you know, hauling, hauling bookcases around and stuff like that. Is it okay if I do it? And I said, Hey, if you feel up to it, you know, but where, where are back support while you're doing it, please. <laughs> right. All right. Do something <laughs> you know, but like, you know, and, and this just goes to show like people can have very varied courses. Um, but you never kind of know, you know, it doesn't mean that they can't do well at the end. Um, and really in the end, you know, it was pretty miraculous that he recovered as much function as he did after, um, not after having a caught equino for eight days. Um, but Man. you know, really you, you don't want that to happen if you don't want it, if, if you can help it. And really, I think if he had been detected earlier, he might not have needed to go to a rehab because he might've had a full rebound right away. A lot of times these ones that are caught early within 24 hours, you do it and the urinary function normalizes. 
Um, yeah. And so all the more reason to say, hey, catch these early if you can. Yeah. So, you know, so with this last case, you know, you took it back, you, you know, had to kind of do a whole nine yards on him and, you know, yep. laminectomy and effusion. And you mentioned before that he initially got an epidural steroid injections. Um, who, I guess, at what part of the treatment are you, yes. you know, sending these patients for epidural steroid injections? And what are some of the kind of other treatments when we can talk about um, surgery here shortly, but kind of what, what patients are getting these steroid injections and yeah. why? Definitely. So typically these are patients who are not getting better over the first six weeks. Um, and you know, they're, they're trying physical therapy. They're trying, you know, either oral steroids or, or NSAIDs and they're not improving and their function is still limited, but they are really trying everything they can to avoid surgery. So in these cases, in these disc herniation cases, epidural steroid injections can be useful. Now they're not going to help 100% of people, but there are some trials that showed that approximately 50% of patients who had epidural steroid injections for treatment of leg symptoms due to disc herniations were actually able to avoid surgeries compared to controls. So if you figure 90% of people, you know, get better with conservative management, and even the people that aren't getting better, you know, a portion of them can get better with an epidural steroid injection, um, that can be useful. And really what I tell patients, because they get confused, they think, oh, is it going to treat the disc herniation? It doesn't treat the disc herniation. What it's doing is it's calming down the nerve root to buy you time for your body to actually flatten out the disc herniation. So the, the thing that I didn't mention earlier was that a large reason that a lot of these patients can be successfully treated non-operatively is that most disc herniations will flatten out with time. So our body has a wonderful way of actually taking care of the disc herniation on its own in a majority of cases. And the number varies depending on what study you look at, but anywhere between um, like 60 to 85% of disc herniations will flatten out with time over the course of six months to a year. And so basically wow. you're just trying to let, you're just trying to help them along through the process. Um, and so that's where the epidural steroid injections are useful, where it is the most likely thing short of surgery to really calm down that nerve because you're delivering steroids directly to the nerve root. Um, so it's overall epidural steroid injections are less successful in some other pathologies, but in disc pathologies, because what you're just trying to do is allow the body to actually take care of the underlying issue. Um, it can be really helpful. Most important thing is it's most likely to help with pain. It's less likely to address numbness and weakness. Now, if somebody has just a little bit of numbness and weakness, it's totally reasonable, but you don't want to send somebody with like a significant foot drop for an epidural and try to get them better. You know, it, if somebody is absolutely against surgery, certainly an epidural is better than nothing, but overall it's really better targeted to somebody that has a lot of radicular pain, maybe a little numbness and weakness, but not something that would otherwise push you to surgery. And they're trying to avoid surgery. Yeah. And, and speaking of surgery, so say we've had this yeah. patient that, you know, had a disc herniation, didn't get better after six weeks. It came back, still had, you know, neurological symptoms. So you got an MRI, sent them for an epidural steroid injection. They got that. It came back, said it helped a little bit, but they're still having pain and they want yeah. some type of surgery. Yeah. What, uh, what are the different surgical options? And then how do you yes. kind of go from there? So I, I had jumped ahead a little bit when I was talking about the case of what we do with cauto syndrome and it was mentioning, you know, hemilaminectomies, et cetera. I think one of the toughest things when I was first learning about spine was figuring out like what in the world, what's a laminotomy, a laminectomy, a laminoplasty, what in the world are all these things? Um, so basically a laminotomy and sometimes it's called a keyhole laminotomy. It's just making a small window in the lamina. So it's just making a small little window on the one side in order to move aside the nerves and go and grab a piece of this that's sitting where it's not supposed to. Um, a laminectomy or hemilaminectomy, it's a larger decompressive procedure typically. Now, occasionally you need it to better access the spinal canal, say in a cauto syndrome, but more commonly, it's more when somebody has a lot of arthritic changes, degenerative changes that are kind of narrowing the whole spinal canal, and you need to kind of really open things up and make things wide open because they have a lot of degenerative changes everywhere. Um, so typically for disc herniations, you're most commonly doing a laminotomy, though sometimes a larger, um, a larger uh, removal of lamina is necessary. And once you remove that lamina, then you go down, you protect the nerve roots, and you can actually remove those underlying uh, disc fragments, sometimes, you know, one large one, sometimes multiple ones. So in terms of the technique, what we actually do is we go down to that inner laminar window. So that's kind of that space between two lamina that we go and we use to be able to access the spinal canal 
So let's say it's an L4, L5 disc herniation. We go down to that, to whichever side is the most affected at L4, L5. Most important thing is confirming the operative level. That's always the biggest, you know, the, the biggest thing about identifying, you know, just like same side um, joint surgeries like and joints, things like that. Yeah. Gotta, gotta confirm the level. <laughs> yeah. So I prefer actually identifying the inner laminar window itself. I find that to be kind of the most foolproof way. Um, and then once you've identified that you're at the proper level, then you create that small window and um, running in between those two lamina within the inner laminar window is a, the ligamentum flavum. That's assuming that somebody has not had surgery at that level before. So that's the ligament that overlies the thecal sac. So we kind of, we make that little window that um, we remove the bone that's on top or um, basically superficial to the lig ligamentum flavum. And then we have to remove that ligamentum flavum so that we can see the thecal sac. And oftentimes we'll see that it's kind of, as soon as we remove that ligamentum flavum, it kind of pooches up and you can see how it's really um, pushed uh, dorsally because of the disc herniation below. And then we want to protect and retract the traversing nerve roots. And so um, kind of gently moving them aside so that we can safely get to the disc. And we want to make sure that we minimize excessive or prolonged retraction of the nerve roots. Um, and I think that's good to know as residents, because oftentimes we make you guys retract the nerve roots. And so we yes. might constantly adjust, you know, or, oh, not quite, you know, it's these little like micro motions. Um, and so one thing that can make you look really good is basically you want to make sure that you're not only holding onto the nerve root retractor, but also have your hand on something as a stabilizer, whether it's the patient's body or, you know, if it's a bigger retractor kind of against the table, but you want to have your hand against something. If you're just holding it in, in air, then you're not going to be stable and you're going to constantly get adjusted. Um, and so that's kind of a nice little trick that can make you look good when you're retracting the nerve roots. Okay. So, you know, you've done that. So, you know, you're doing, and we're describing again, the laminotomy and then going with a micro disectomy and not a yes. laminectomy where you remove the entire lamina or, or hemilaminectomy, we do that. Um, so, you know, so say we, you have, you know, one of us that, you have an assistant that's retracting their nerve root. Where do we, where, yeah. where do we go from there to get, you know, all the way to the end part where we have the, this fragments that are all the way yes. out. So this is where it's important to kind of know the anatomy and know where the disc herniation is. If it's transligamentous, if it's already come through the ligament, then, you know, it's going to be sitting right there somewhere. You move aside the nerve roots and you should see kind of that tail of disc um, kind of sitting within the spinal canal. But let's say that it was a, um, a subligamentous disc herniation, which is, which is fairly common. Um, then you're actually incising the PLL. So we'll get kind of a, a thin blade. We make sure you're, um, you know, that, that the assistant is retracting the nerve roots appropriately. We make a little incision of the PLL and we kind of make it right where we see that it's prominent. Usually you can kind of see there's this protuberance, um, and you incise it and then we'll often kind of probe around and that'll loosen up the disc fragments to be able to remove them from beneath that PLL. Sometimes it may even be a subannular disc herniation. So maybe we're actually incising the annulus as well um, and, and removing those disc fragments that have kind of um, pushed up against the rim of the annulus. And then another important thing that we do is we actually probe for residual fragments. Um, so usually the nucleus pulposus kind of functions as, as one piece. Um, so it's not kind of this like loose stuff that's all kind of intermixed within, within the disc. It kind of functions as a whole. And so sometimes you'll actually have a disrupted fragment that stays within the disc space. And so our concern is we don't want that loose piece to then squirt out from this um, incision that we've just made in the annulus or the PLL, et cetera. And so we don't want them to get a recurrent disc herniation immediately. And so we don't want to remove all of their disc because then they won't have a disc left to be functional. We don't want to leave pieces that are likely to herniate out. So kind of, you know, following the um, kind of going, splitting down the middle is we probe around to make sure there's no loose pieces. Um, I tell people actually that the disc, it's kind of like a tempur pillow. So if you rip off a bunch of pieces of it, and then stuff them back in the pillowcase. We're trying to get those loose pieces out, but leave the rest of the pillow intact so that you can still sleep on it. So, that's so they're all good. You have great analogies. <laughs> uh, I remember the, the first analogy you had was a meniscus tear with the yeah. annulus fibrosis. I was like, oh, that's a good one. Yeah. And like a rock yeah. and a hard place. This is another good one. I like the analogies. <laughs> These are all the ones that I tell patients. Because the fact is, if you can't explain something to a patient, you know, they're not going to know what in the world you're doing. And then, you know, the more they understand something ahead of time, the less they'll have questions afterwards.
you know, gotcha. they'll understand, oh, this is why that happened. This is why that happened. Um, so yeah, so we don't want any residual fragments in there that are, that are going to cause any badness down the road if we can help it. And then we ensure the nerve roots are well decompressed. So the important thing is that disc is never going to go back to its pristine normal shape. It's always going to bulge to some degree. So we always want to make sure that that nerve root has plenty of room. And so sometimes we do do just a little bit of a decompression. We just kind of um, undercut the joint a little bit just to leave some room. So that's where, you know, if you're in a micro disc procedure, but you see that, oh, they're undercutting the joint just a little bit. That's why, because you want to make sure that that nerve is kind of free and clear and that uh, you accomplish what you set out to do. And in here, are you, are we showing this, this red area for those that are, that are uh, watching this red area on the lamina, this is where you would somewhere make, kind of make your hole. Exactly. Uh, where yeah, we do the laminotomy. It. Exactly. Perfect. And then this is retracting the nerve roots was a blue arrow. Yes. So that's where the retractor goes to protect the nerves so that then um, whoever's doing the primary procedure can go through that window and get into that disc and find all of these. So this is kind of what I was getting at where there were all these different loose fragments that were sitting in there. So sometimes there are quite a few, um, and they look like imitation crab meat, um, <laughs> for those of you who are, uh, looking at the PowerPoint. So that was and a so, very large one. <laughs> and, and and so what do you do post-operatively? You know, are they allowed to like, you know, go back and go run a marathon the next day? Or <laughs> so so typically they go home the same day, at least in my practice. Now there are some, yeah. you know, there are some surgeons who like to keep all these patients overnight, make sure they're voiding, make sure they're mobilizing. And, you know, that's totally fine too. Um, but they have a very strict restriction on the lifting, bending, or twisting for six weeks. Why? Because it takes six weeks for their annulus to actually heal. So you don't want them doing lifting, bending, and twisting, immediately re-disrupting their disc and re-herniating. Um, and so if you limit them for six weeks, then that's, that um, lessens that likelihood. After six weeks, then I restart core strengthening and I start them with more of kind of static or more neutral exercises or extension-based exercises, and then gradually return to full activity. Um, so some things that I restrict are things like golf. Um, I tell them, you know, they should really do start into their core strengthening first before trying to get back into golf, because otherwise their core won't be ready. Um, their core will be kind of shut down and they go right back to golf and they twist and it's, you know, not controlled by a nice strong core and they're going to be more prone to a disc herniation. In terms of activities that don't involve lifting, bending, or twisting, let's say they, they want to get on an exercise bike, they want to get on the elliptical, they, um, you know, they want to do um, some kickboarding in the pool. I do let them do that. Um, obviously the pool, we wanna wait for the incision to heal. Um, but as long as they're not doing lifting, busting, and bending and twisting, I think some degree of aerobic activity can be good. Um, in terms of running, I usually do like for them to at least start some gentle core strengthening before they go for any serious runs. Um, but I do let people do that um, somewhere between the four and six week mark if, if they feel up to it and they feel that they have regained kind of their uh, mobility. Okay. And so, you know, home same day, six weeks, kind of unlimited activity. No, like, just like you said, no lifting, bending, twisting. And I guess outcome wise, how do these patients typically do? You, you see like kind of what, you know, outcome wise they do well, they get re herniations or, you know, yep. I, I know the sport trials is, is a big trial. I've, I've seen it. Uh, I've seen it referenced to in many places. Can you quickly uh, touch yeah. base on this? Yeah. So the sport trial, um, it was a landmark trial and there were actually different arms of it, but there was a specific arm um, for disc herniations. Um, and so it was a randomized controlled trial from uh, multiple different centers around the country. And so it was about 500 patients with leg and back symptoms and MRI confirmed disc herniation. And so they were randomized, either continued non-operative management uh, versus getting a microdiscectomy. And this was actually persistent symptoms. I forget whether it was six weeks or three months, um, but it was more than six weeks. Um, so the continued non-op was kind of continuing with the physical therapy, the anti-inflammatories, epidural steroid injections, et cetera. Um, the problem was, is that this study actually had a lot of crossover. So a lot of the patients um, crossed over to, uh, to surgery within three months. Um, right. But there actually were some patients in the operative cohort, you know, who 
maybe they were amongst the patients that were starting to get better and then they continue to get better. And so they didn't have surgery. And I think this goes into like different patients have different expectations, different timelines. So it can be tough to do a randomized controlled trial with surgery um, because somebody might get randomized to the surgery and they might've originally, when they signed up for the trial thought, Oh yeah, you know, that that's fine. Kind of whatever's best for me. We'll kind of figure it out. But then they either start getting better or they're getting worse and they kind of have an idea in their mind of which way they want to go. Um, and so one important thing is both groups did have significant improvement and that kind of gets into, hey, your body will take care of a discrimination to some degree. But of the patients that actually crossed over and had surgery, um, they actually had much better outcomes. Um, so while both groups saw improvement overall, the ones that had surgery did see a greater degree of improvement. And that was actually persistent, not only at two years, but also with later follow-up studies that were published separately at four years and eight years. Um, so that's, that's a really important data point. So, you know, some, um, some have criticized this study. Some people that say that no, you know, no spine surgeries work have decided to uh -huh. criticize the study by saying, you know, oh, but the randomized groups, you know, there was no difference, but that was because there was so much crossover. So there's really nothing to evaluate there. But when you looked at the, as treated, you know, the patient self-selected, but you know what, that's, that's real life. Patients self-select in real life too. We give them options. You know, that's why we involve them in the decision-making once they're, candidates for surgery who involve them. And some people are going to lean more towards surgery and some people away from it. And, you know, whatever decision is right for them is right for them. But we can use this data to say, hey, we do know that of the patients that elected to have surgery with what, um, with, you know, what the patient is presenting with, with the disc herniation, that they do overall have better outcomes and that they do quite well. You know, a, a vast majority of patients um, have improvement in their overall function um, fairly soon after having a microdisc. Yeah, and I, I I know I've definitely seen that reference before and asked on on test questions. So for any residents listening to this, definitely rewind those past two minutes, and listen to it again, uh, because those that is very important information. And what are the typically like complications? What complications yeah. are, have you seen with this? Exactly. And you know what are kind of the different rates? Yep. So we kind of have the intraop complications and then what I call kind of the later complications or, you know, maybe not even complications, but kind of later sequela. Um, so dural tear. So I was mentioning like a CSF leak, basically the dura surrounds the spinal fluid and the nerves. And, you know, there will be a certain um, percentage of patients that have an incidental CSF leak or dural tear. Um, basically you kind of snag the, the, uh, the dura and it's able to leak out CSF and you either repair it or patch it. Um, so in the sport trial, uh, the rate was about 2%. Again, this was kind of very busy spine centers. So um, it makes sense that they would have a lower rate compared to kind of what the typically quoted rate is. So typically quoted rate is two to 4% in, disc, um, in these disc herniation cases. Um, nerve injury, typically from traction. So that's why I was saying, you know, we're, we're very conscientious about how much and for how long we retract the nerve roots. So if it's a big disc herniation and we're having trouble getting to it initially, we might actually lessen the retraction and kind of try to probe around the disc herniation and see if there's already a rent in the PLL so that we can debulk it a little bit um, because patients can get an area of numbness afterwards from aggressive uh, retraction. Um, very important uh, complication to be aware of that's very rare, um, but very important to catch is a hematoma. So if it is causing a neurological decline, um, that's a surgical emergency. So you have a patient that had a microdiscectomy, um, let's say a few days later, all of a sudden they have worsening leg symptoms. And then all of a sudden they're not just in the area that they originally had leg symptoms, but it's, you know, their whole leg or they have some weakness or they even are getting some bowel and bladder dysfunction. That's a surgical emergency, um, kind of similar to Okada equina syndrome, but from a hematoma. Um, and so occasionally that can happen from the epidural veins if it doesn't clot off properly. And then they um, basically have, you know, bleeding into the spinal canal. So those are kind of the initial complication rates, things that can happen either intraoperatively or initially postoperatively. Long-term in terms of back pain, some patients are terrified that because they've had a disc herniation that now they'll become this chronic low back pain patient. And I tell patients, I say, hey, I can't, I can't predict whether or not you're going to have back pain in the future. There's, there's absolutely nothing that I can use as a crystal ball. You might be prone to having flare-ups of discogenic back pain in the future because basically the rim of their disc has been disrupted. It may be sensitive in the future. Um, 
And so I tell patients, you know, ways that at least we can lessen that likelihood or at least decrease the severity of those flare ups is by maintaining a strong core, because we actually know that that's one of the gold standard ways to manage disc related back pain. Um, and I mentioned earlier that there is an increased risk of patients having persistent back pain afterwards if excessive disc is removed. So that's why we're cautious about not removing too much disc. But that's balanced against the risk of recurrent disc herniation. And the rates of that range from 5 to 15%. Um, and so um, what's important, though, is that having a microdiscectomy surgery does not increase that likelihood. So let's say somebody is treated non-operatively for a disc herniation. They get better. They still have a 5 to 15% rate of having a recurrent disc herniation that can either be in the same location, which is more common because the rim of the disc is already weaker, but it could happen at another level. And I've told patients it's multifactorial, you know, they've, um, they've already had one disc herniation. There may be something in their biomechanics that predisposes them. There may even be something kind of in their biology. You know, some people are more ligamentously lax and some people are more, you know, they have relatively weaker rims of their, of their discs. Um, and, uh, and it also, obviously if they've had a disc herniation, it's already weak in the rim of their disc. So obviously they're more, they're more likely to in that location as well. So, okay. um, those are the important things. And, and the, the biggest thing that I tell patients is core strength, core strength, core strength with a maintenance program. And that's the best way to try to prevent those last two. You can't totally prevent them, but it's kind of the best way to lessen the likelihood of those. Yeah. I remember after doing my spine rotation, I would just tell my mom, anytime she says anything's wrong with her back, I'm telling her to go, go like strengthen her core. Yes. <laughs> the yes. First thing I keep exactly. Go do, go do core strength. And it doesn't have to be that they're constantly in physical therapy. It can be, right. Hey, they do a yoga routine or, Hey, they have Pilates or, Hey, every time they go to the gym, they do planks and pushups. Um, you know, and I tell that to my guys who are like, ah, you know, I don't, I don't want to do Pilates. I don't want to do yoga. Um, <laughs> I think they're great for everybody, but you know, for, um, but some guys like they want to incorporate it in their strength routine. I say, okay, you know, do some planks and pushups. Pushups are awesome. You know, they work your, as long as you do them properly, they work your core and they work your arms at the same time. It's kind of getting, getting multiple different, uh, strengthening routines in one. Yeah. And, and, and yoga is hard. Yoga's <laughs> I did very it. Like, hard. This is not easy. <laughs> yoga is very hard. So, uh, and, and so one of the things you mentioned a little bit earlier before we wrap up here yeah. was you talked about the uh, kind of these foraminal or in, in these far lateral disc protrusions. And you mentioned yeah. that when spine surgeons see this, it's not, you know, we don't want you don't necessarily want to see this all the time. <laughs> no. What's kind of different from these yeah. and how you treat these and approach these versus your, you know, paracentral or your central discriminations. Yep, definitely. Um, so basically, you know, I mentioned before that it can either be inside the foramen, like a true foraminal discrimination, it can be farther lateral. Um, and for anybody that's looking at my MRI um, that I've posted, that's actually a lovely one that's kind of a variety of locations. It's both interforaminal and also has a far lateral component. It's just kind of that whole lateral part of the disc was blown out. Um, so it can be both. Um, but, uh, the most important thing, so especially the foraminal ones can be difficult to access because it's right beneath the facet joint. If you think about, you know, if somebody's doing surgery, when you get to a paracentral disc herniation, you make a little window in the lamina and then you keep going anteriorly and it's right there. Well, if you think about how you would get to those foraminal disc herniations, well, the facet joint is kind of just dorsal to it. Um, so it's difficult to access the far lateral ones. Um, those ones are not right under the facet joint, but the tricky thing about those is that first off, I mentioned the dorsal root ganglion is sitting there and it does not like to be messed with, which is why we don't like these. Um, and second off, you think about it when you're in the spinal canal, once you get in through the lamina and you take out the ligamentum flavum, it's pretty obvious. The fecal sac is just sitting right there. You know where it is. You're in the spinal canal, you know, what's going to be in there. When you're looking at these far lateral disc herniations, we're dissecting through muscle and then we're looking for a nerve and that nerve can be stretched out over that disc herniation and thinned out. And when you're actually in there, you're kind of looking around and, and really looking at, is that a muscle fiber? Or is that a nerve? You know, where, where is the nerve running? Right, so you're hard. really having to carefully go down because you're just in the midst of these muscle planes. Um, and so that's, that makes it tricky as well. Um, so you actually typically for those true far laterals, you're actually doing more of a paraspinal incision typically. Um, so this, like we call it a wilty approach. Um, and you're actually going through this plane between, um, between the paraspinal muscles to directly access it. And so sometimes you do need to remove a little bit of the lateral aspect of the joint just to 
better access it. And sometimes also that better allows you to kind of trace the nerve out over it and be safer about it and not have to worry about kind of moving the nerve aside too much. Um, and then uh, you will see some of these cases actually, you know, these are cases where um, occasionally it'll actually uh, be converted to a fusion. Um, and the reason for that, it, you know, there's a few different reasons. First off, you know, sometimes just where that disc herniation is, you determine, hey, I really can't safely get to that disc herniation without disrupting that facet joint so much that all destabilize them. So that's one reason. Um, but another reason is if they blew out a, a huge amount of disc, sometimes they actually kind of, collapse that side of their disc. Um, and if you think about when I talked about pedicle nerve root disc, pedicle nerve root disc, well, so the foramen where the nerve root runs, it contains the nerve root. And then also, um, you know, that, that disc is also contributing to the height of that foramen. So if that disc is collapsed because you've pushed out a bunch of disc, first off, the disc is occupying part of that foramen and pushing against the nerve. But second off, the actual height of that foramen is less because that disc height is not as big. And so you've actually collapsed your foramen. So no matter how much disc you remove, if anything, you know, you go in there and you remove the disc herniation, it's probably going to collapse more because you're, you know, taking out some of the disc there. Um, and so sometimes they've just collapsed so much that you also know, Hey, I, that nerve, even if I take out that disc herniation that's sitting there, they still may have significant symptoms um, because they've just collapsed their disc and therefore collapsed kind of the height of their foramen. And so you will see sometimes those um, get turned into an inner body fusion. And um, this, this, the focus of this talk topic was not obviously on all the different types of fusions, but it's often a, it's often a T lift. Um, you know, so just sometimes people might wonder oh, how in the world does a disc herniation turn into a fusion? And that's why, you know, it's, it's uncommon for a disc herniation to turn into a fusion case, but these are instances where it, it can be a little more likely in these four lateral disc herniations, just because of the difficulty with accessing them. Right. So, you know, you just need to recognize that and prepare and have it just, you know, available, or at least at the rep know, you know, that we may need, um, you know, we may need some hardware depending on what happens. Exactly. Yeah. Or just, you know, find out from the attending, Hey, you know, so is this something where, you know, are you planning for fusion? Or are you planning to just, you know, do you think you can access it? And typically the surgeon would have that planned out in advance. It wouldn't, it usually would not be a game time decision. Oh, okay. um, rarely, rarely it might be, you know, rarely it might be, Hey, I'm going to try to access it. And if I can't access it, then we have a, a TLIF as a backup option. Okay. And then can you take us through kind of this last case here that we have yep, definitely. Uh, set up? Yeah. So this is actually one that, um, that kind of crystallizes what I was just talking about. So this is a, um, 73 year old female, but she's very active, you know, literally presented like a, you know, a 50 something year old. Um, and those are among my favorite patients cause they're so tough and spunky. Um, <laughs> but she presented with severe pain and foot weakness and kind of partial foot drop, like not full blown foot drop. She had some strength, um, but definitely kind of tripping over her foot, et cetera for a month. It's definitely concerning with regards to her motor exam. And so looking at her because of her foot weakness, send her for an MRI sooner. We don't make her do six weeks of physical therapy. We send her for an MRI because we're worried about her weakness. And that showed that she kind of hit the jackpot in terms of what you don't want, which is that she had multiple different things going on at the same level. So she first off had a foraminal disc herniation at L4, L5. And we talked earlier that the foraminal disc herniations are going to hit the exiting nerve root. So it hit the right. L4 nerve root. So that makes sense. She has a foot drop. It's a foraminal disc herniation. It hits the L4 nerve root. Her tibant is weak. Um, and she also going along with that had lots of disc height, both because she probably had some element of degenerative disc disease before, and then she pushed out the disc that she had. And so she further lost some height. Um, and so the goal is to maximize decompression of the, uh, nerve root, especially because she has a foot drop. So you really don't want to do an incomplete job of taking the pressure off the nerve and allowing that nerve to recover. The other thing that was tricky with her is she also at the same level actually had some degenerative stenosis and it was significant enough that that was also potentially contributing. Um, not so much, obviously the L4 nerve root has already exited, um, but the L5 nerve also can contribute to some degree to the tibialis anterior strength. Um, and it can obviously contribute to radicular pain, et cetera. Um, and it was fairly significant stenosis. So I knew I also wanted to address that at the same time. And remember how I was talking about how you have these foraminal disc herniations. A lot of time you're removing the lateral part of the facet, 
right. then if I'm doing a decompression, I'm also taking some of the, the central part of the, um, you know, the posterior elements of the spinal canal and taking some of the medial facet. So now, you know, we're taking medial facet, we're taking lateral facet, <laughs> you know, it's pretty much impossible to do this without destabilizing her. So I yep. said, you know, as much as I try to avoid fusions, I really did feel that she needed it. And so in her case, I did recommend a T lift basically going, um, removing that facet, which makes it very easy to access, you know, the disc herniation. And it also opens up the spinal canal. So it kind of accomplishes all of the above. Um, I was able to remove that focal disc fragment. So we still do that microdiscectomy. Um, but then we use that approach where I, where I did the microdiscectomy, you know, where I incised through the, uh, through the annulus, I then use that as my access point to actually remove the entirety of the disc and place an implant. Um, so you're kind of, you know, able to directly access, um, both the disc herniation, but also be able to access that entire disc space to do the transforaminal, um, inner body fusion. So that's why that's typically the favored inner body fusion technique, um, when we're doing that in the face of a foraminal disc herniation. Um, so in terms of post-op, she had immediate relief of her radicular symptoms and she had excellent recovery of strength over the following three months. Um, so kind of, you know, it was, um, it was really great to see her recover that because that's why we did the fusion was really so she could recover, um, her full strength as much as possible, um, to optimally decompress the nerve root. And then, um, so for her, because she was a fusion, I actually do restrict them for longer, no bending, lifting, twisting for three months. So longer than with a typical disc herniation, but then afterwards a full return to activities. Um, and so just to emphasize, this is not necessarily what we do for all lateral disc herniations, but for specific cases, it's important. Um, and for those of you who are looking at the x-rays, you can actually see the area where the facet was removed. Um, and so kind of um, in between the two screws, you can see that there's a lucency and that's actually directly where I've removed bone, facet and, um, and some of the pars to be able to access the disc space. So you can kind of almost visualize how somebody goes through that little window of bone and then is able to access the disc to put in that implant. Yeah, you can really see it there. It's, it's yeah. really, uh, it's clear and- in my, in my very, very limited, uh, very limited experience, at least most of the patients that in the cases I have been that have had some type of, you know, disc herniation, like almost, almost all of them are, are like immediately post-op there. A lot of their neurological symptoms are just immediately better. And it's, yes. it's kind of crazy to see, yeah. um, kind of rewarding too, but also I was like, dang, wow, it's, it's crazy. It's already better. Yes. Definitely. So I, I kind of, and, and this is not based on any, uh, any, you know, evidence-based medicine, but I tell people in my experience that the, the great bulk of patients, you know, 80% or more of patients have significant relief in their symptoms. Um, I'd say, you know, it's actually a, a minority that have 100% relief right away. I tell people expect to have milder symptoms, you know, that nerve, it's not going to calm down immediately all the time. Um, so the nerve can still be sensitive. Sometimes they feel great, but then as they're getting about walking around more and they stretch out the nerve, they feel it, you know, they have some twinges. So I tell people it's totally normal. You know, the nerve's going to stay hypersensitive for a little bit. Um, and then there is a small percentage of patients and more common in those far lateral disc herniations where I, I told you that that dorsal root ganglion can be really sensitive. There's a small population of patients where that nerve is still just hypersensitive afterwards. And it's a, it's a pretty small proportion, but I think it's really important to warn people that that is a possibility and that usually in those cases, we're able to quiet down the nerve root. Um, but uh, really the vast majority of patients see significant improvement right away. And it, it is very gratifying. Yeah. And Dr. Hollinger, earlier you mentioned kind of the discogenic back pain. One of the last things I want to just ask you about is for this, how do we, I guess, identify this? And then what is your treatment for that? I know that may yeah. be a little bit different than our treatment for our typical, you know, lumbar disc herniation with ridiculous yeah. symptoms, for example. Yeah. So a lot of times, actually, the very initial treatment is fairly similar, because if you think about it, you know, the the underlying mechanics or the underlying pathology is somewhat similar. You know, they've had a flexion injury to their disc. And so a lot of times, you know, anti-inflammatories, maybe even steroids for a severe flare up and doing therapy with an extension based protocol. And I also have them consider a corset for short term use. Again, you know, their backs, their backs really locked up. We want to move around, but we don't want them to flex. I also actually have a handout that I give to patients on, on lifestyle adjustments. So using a sit to stand desk and things like that. 
Um, and for very refractory cases, we do sometimes use epidural injections, certainly not as commonly as with a, um, disc herniation that's actually impinging on a nerve, but, but it can, um, there is some evidence behind it and it, it can be useful if somebody really just has severe disc related back pain flare, that's not going away. Um, now in terms of surgical treatment, the pendulum is swung back and forth. So there was a period of time where spine surgery, um, you know, we kind of, we were all excited about fusions and we want to fuse anybody that had, you know, back pain and degenerative disc disease. So that became really common. And then spine surgeons got a really bad rap, um, because not <laughs> all those patients did well. And so, you know, the pendulum swung to, oh, spine surgery doesn't work. Fusions don't work. You know, every so often you'll see in a, in a major media publication, some article talking about how spine surgery doesn't work, et cetera. Um, and it's always frustrating, <laughs> but, right. um, but you know, it's a good point that, doing a multi-level fusion, if somebody has three levels of degenerative disc disease and you do a multi-level fusion um, and they don't have a deformity, they don't have instability, you're just doing it for degenerative changes and they have this very vague back pain, you know, it does not improve outcomes. However, if there's isolated disc degeneration and they have a very classic pattern of discogenic low back pain, you can consider a fusion. And then actually more recently, disc replacements have gotten a little more data behind them. Those are probably not going to show up on anybody's board exam. So I'm not going to go into them in detail. Um, and even fusions, you know, it's still something that um, we're very selective as to um, patients that, uh, that undergo it. So I would say it's un doing surgery or fusion on these like disc related back pain. It's unlikely the correct response on an exam. However, in real life, there are some patients that really fit the criteria well, and they've really tried everything and, um, and they can do well after a fusion, but it is not a home run. So I tell patients, you know, there are some patients that do really well with it. Um, but kind of the best data that we have shows that about 50% of people have significant relief of their symptoms after having a fusion for, um, this disc related back pain. So it's certainly not the 80 to 95% of patients that do really well after a microdiscectomy. So it's just really important to make sure that a patient kind of is aware of that because also there are downsides with fusions. So, um, so certainly it's a, it's, it's typically a long discussion that we have with patients. Um, so it's not common, but, um, but it does happen in those really refractory cases, but really majority of the patients, physical therapy, physical therapy, physical therapy, and then having a maintenance program. Um, and I tell pa patients, it's just like maintenance on your car. Our bodies need maintenance. You know, right. we have to keep them strong. As we get older, we're not doing, we're not running around like kids that are constantly using all the muscles in our body to be, um, you know, to keep our, our stabilizer muscles strong. So we have to do work to keep those um, stabilizers strong, whether that be that somebody has a gym routine or, you know, does certain classes or, you know, in other ways strengthens their core. But that's really the most important thing. And, and we know, right, at least as of now, you know, the, the, test answer is not going to be to, you know, for go to surgery, at least to operate on discogenic back pain. But yeah. you did say there, there were, you know, a certain very select group of people that you may, you know, offer some surgical intervention. So in your clinic, what are those, those, you know, indications yeah. for surgical treatment? Yeah. So typically just a single level of degenerative disc disease or disc involvement. Um, the other level should have mild, if any, degenerative changes. Um, there have been some smaller scale studies that have looked at um, some patients that have, you know, two very clear levels. Um, but I would say the data is stronger for just having a single level and they should have axial back pain that's persistent for over six months. And that's despite really optimizing the non-surgical management. So that's not, I did three sessions of physical therapy and it didn't help. That's, you know, they really did hard work. They did a really good physical therapy program where their physical therapist actually had them do strengthening exercises. Um, and they just still have this persistent back pain. And at least in my hands, I like to see that it follows that typical pattern. You know, they shouldn't just have back pain all the time. They should say, you know, yeah, it's really bad when I sit for a while or I stand for a while. You know, if I do a lot of flexion, it really gets aggravated. You know, I really want to see some of those classic those classic patterns. And that makes me feel much more comfortable that they really do have pain that's related to the disc and not just kind of chronic musculoskeletal back pain. That's just mechanical. Um, that's kind of vague and nonspecific. Um, they should have an absence of unmanaged psychiatric disorders. So it doesn't mean that they can't have well-controlled anxiety or, or depression, but if they're unmanaged, then it's not going to bode well. Um, they should be non-smoking for at least six weeks. 
Um, and then usually we do use an anterior approach just because then you're able to take out the entire disc um, and you're able to really put in a nice size implant, uh, but certainly other forms of inner body fusion are also acceptable. Usually it is gonna be an inner body fusion because the whole point is to um, take out the disc to, um, to decrease that uh, pain generator. Um, and uh, I was mentioning the total disc replacement has been used for this population from an anterior approach. Again, that's newer. There is some um, good evidence behind it, um, but it's not going to be probably your test answer as of yet, but you may see it in there. There is actually um, some increasing evidence behind it, especially because you might be able to save somebody a fusion. Um, so that may be kind of something that becomes more common as the years go by. Yeah, I was just going to say, it's going to be really interesting to see, you know, like five, 10 years from now where we're at and how much different, um, you know, our treatment options will be at that point versus now versus, you know, like 15, 20 years down the line. Definitely. Um, but Dr. Hollinger, I think this was a, a great talk um, uh, about, you know, kind of our lumbar disc pathology. We talked about a lot. We talked about the anatomy of the lumbar spine and the disc. We talked about, you know, history, physical exams, imaging, what to get for, um, you know, what to get, when to get things, non-op management, operative management. Um, and we didn't, we talked about a couple of cases as well. Anything else you want the, you know, the people to know, you know, to get from, you know, kind of this episode of this podcast talking about, you know, this, this lumbar disc pathology is very super high yield topic that they ask us about a lot. So, and I'm glad we covered a good amount of things. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, the things that are high yield for the test are definitely knowing the dermatomes and myotomes and recognizing it. There's often these like multi-step questions where it'll say, oh, there's an L45 paracentral disc herniation. Where do they have weakness? So kind of understanding the different components of it. First, knowing your dermatomes and myotomes, but also knowing, hey, a disc herniation in this place will affect this nerve. Um, and that's where really kind of understand, understanding that three-dimensional anatomy um, is important. So that's kind of for, you know, testing purposes, that's important. I think for clinical real life purposes, I think, you know, first off, definitely knowing the, the red flag things, your cauda equina, when to be concerned um, or other reasons for, uh, for imaging. And also just really knowing um, what to look for in a history and physical. You'll look like a rock star if you recognize that pattern of, <laughs> you know, what a typical disc herniation looks like. And so you come out and you talk to the attending and you say, you know, hey, this patient came in, he has this, this, and that my differential diagnosis first thing is you know potential disc herniation with uh with radiculopathy you know that's great to be able to recognize that um and then knowing in the surgery kind of how you can be the most helpful and what anatomy you're looking at um because i always find that when i'm having residents in with me, the more they know their anatomy, the more they really understand, the more I can trust them to do things. Um, because if they kind of don't really know why they're retracting the nerves or what they're doing, you know, it's not going to be as safe a procedure. So I think the more you can really know what you're doing and why you're doing it, the better. Totally agree. Um, Dr. Hollinger, it's been a pleasure having you on the podcast. Again, I really appreciate you, I appreciate you taking your time out of your day to come on and talk about uh, some spine talks. Our first lumbar spine talk, finally, we got that done. Um, awesome. Again, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. And thanks for doing this. I think it's, it's awesome for all, for all the residents as well as uh, attendings that can benefit from it. Thanks a lot.